Hi and welcome everyone. I'm Sam Kernahan, the Director of the Committee for Sydney's Resilience Program. It's great to see so many of you here today for this discussion on the circular and sustainable waste strategy. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, wherever you may be this morning or this afternoon. I'm on the land of the Kamaragal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. I'd like to acknowledge and thank our innovation partners also, Campbelltown City Council, Texas, ICC Sydney, McKinsey and Company and Western Sydney University for their ongoing support of the work we do here at the committee. I'll introduce our all-star lineup in a moment, but first a quick explanation on how we'll run things today. Our speakers are gonna share some insights and perspectives and then we'll dig into the details in conversation and we'd love your questions to help us do that. As always, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A function and I'll do my best to get to all of them. I'm sure you're all used to this by now. So the global context around waste has been rapidly shifting over the past few years, placing increasing pressure on cities like Sydney to look closely at how we manage our waste streams within our own boundaries, particularly with landfill space fast running out. We're increasingly looking at where value creation exists in our current waste streams and thinking about the economic opportunities that are at our doorstep from making our con consumption more circular. And we know that waste contributes 14% of Sydney's carbon emissions, something we will need to address on our journey to net zero by 2030. And with those challenges in mind, the first stage of the New South Wales Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy 2041 was launched earlier this year. We're fortunate to have five leaders from the waste and circular economy field here today to share their insights around that strategy and to identify how government, industry and research are embracing the challenges today and tomorrow. While there are many familiar faces, let me quickly introduce them to you in order of appearance so I can hand over the microphone and ensure we have as much time as possible to hear from them and from you. Dr. Kate Wilson is Executive Director of Climate Change and Sustainability in the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Kate has responsibility for delivery of major programs that are enabling New South Wales government, industry and community to reduce carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions on the path to net zero by 2050. Monica Baroni has been the CEO of the City of Sydney since 2006, having overseen the development implementation of the city's long-term vision for Central Sydney, Sustainable Sydney 2030. Monica is also the chair of the South Sydney Regional Organisation of Council's Waste Working Group and many other things. Richard Kirkman is the CEO of Veolia Australia and New Zealand. Richard is focused on delivering ecological transformation through Veolia's water, waste and energy activities. He's a passionate advocate for preserving and replenishing resources and is pivoting the organisation to be a trusted partner for complex infrastructure whilst influencing policy as an authority of voice on the challenges surrounding the environmental sector. Lisa McLean is the CEO of New South Wales Circular, a government funded circular economy innovation body. Sorry about that. Uh, leading the transition to a zero carbon circular economy in New South Wales and Australia. Lisa has been successfully advising industry and governments in developing a new policy framework and regulation that bring out about market change to enable the circular zero carbon economy over the past 14 years. And finally, we have Associate Professor Ali Abbas. Ali is the Director of the University of Sydney's Waste Transformation Research Hub in the School of Chemical and Biolecular Engineering. He has 20 years experience in the field of process systems engineering, and in recent years, he's been working on circular economy transitions, developing innovations, and identifying ways to translate the circular economy principles into practice. Ali is also the chair of the Australian Circular Economy Conference. Welcome all of you, and thank you again for being part of this really high powered and exciting panel. Kate, let me hand over to you to kick off with an overview of the waste and sustainable materials strategy and the New South Wales government perspective on where to from here. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, um, pleasure to be here. So I'm going to set the context probably for many of my colleagues' um, subsequent talks. So in setting that context, I want to start with the um, just talking about the current problem. So Anna, if you're driving the slides, can we move on? Um, so when we've been working on the new uh, waste and sustainable materials strategy for it was probably about 18 months before it was released. And that was in the context of many challenges that um, beset the, I guess, the waste and resource recovery industry. So the, previously we had the waste and resource recovery strategy, which ran formally until June last year, or that's um, the bridging year now. 
and had a number of targets. And you can see from this slide that we were really struggling to reach many of those targets. So while we were trying to reduce waste generation per capita, for example, it's actually increased between 2015 and um, most recent data in 2019. Again, increasing the recycling, the construction and demolition sector is not too bad, but the um, municipal solid waste and the commercial and industrial coming well below targets. Not surprisingly, diversion of waste from landfill also below targets. Um, and also some challenges with uh, illegal dumping and other hazardous waste. So the, there were some areas where we did well, um, larger number of facilities for managing waste, problem waste, and uh, definite success in reducing litter, but this was quite a series of, of challenges. Now, if we could just move on to the policy context, as well as those, you know, um, that data, we know there've been changes in the recycling market. So there's decreasing demand for recycling, increased costs of recycling. Uh, a lot of that is related to the China sword policy and then the federal waste export bans, which um, remove a, what was previously the, um, you know, a major source of, a major demand source for recycled or recycling materials from Australia. Then there's also a lot more realization about the impact of waste on the environment, particularly plastics. We would all have seen many, the documentary on Netflix and elsewhere about the impact of plastics on the environment and human health. And indeed, now that we can go back to the beach, um, that will be a delight. But we probably all of us know that when we go to the beach, we almost always see one or a number of plastic litter items that have washed up. And finally, the role of waste in climate change has become very um, important and very much front of mind in our consciousness. So organics in landfill directly um, contribute 2% of the net annual emissions in New South Wales. But more significantly, and perhaps even more challengingly, uh, it's estimated that about 45% of global emissions arise from the use and management of materials and products, so from our resource use. So that was a significant policy context. So in June this year, we, we released the Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy 2041. At its heart is um, starting the transition to a circular economy or accelerating that. So really moving from just a focus on waste to thinking about circularity and resource use. It's funded by $356 million, which will kick in at um, July 2022. And I'll talk you through shortly the um, range of initiatives that, it's, that it will do, but it's looking at the whole of the system. So there are a couple of supporting um, strategies. Next slide, Anna. So at the time, they, um, at the same day, there were two supporting documents released, the New South Wales Action Plan, which outlines our commitment to um, address problematic plastics. And then the New South Wales Waste and Sustainable Materials as Infrastructure Needs Strategy it was released then. And of course, since then, the Energy from Waste um, Infrastructure Strategy has also been, or plan has been released. The Net Zero Plan, which is New South Wales' plan for re reducing um, what's the first stage of the plan to reach net zero by 2050 is also significant because that contains a commitment to reach net zero emissions from organics in landfill by 2030. So that has already formed the connection between waste and carbon. So the so moving to a circular economy really does underpin this strategy and I think that's been welcomed by the, the waste sector to see that we're increasingly focusing on resource use I think the, the audience will be very familiar with the concept of a circular economy, which is moving from thinking of the you know, dig up, make, use, and then dispose of and throw away, to thinking how do materials actually circulate in the economy? How can we remove the need for problematic materials in the first place, extend first, second, third life, and um, then use recycled content and only have uh, waste going to either energy from waste or to landfill as a very last resort. Now the strategy has got three focus areas, um, recognizing that circular economy underpins all of those, but you can move to the next slide, please. We've shaped the strategy around these three challenges and I'll talk briefly through each of them. Um, so looking at the infrastructure needs, which are quite considerable, the focus on carbon emissions, which is very new for this strategy, and then um, continuing the excellent work to protect the environment and human health from waste pollution, which continues to be a major focus. And this, of course, shows one of the return and earn 
centres which have been very successful. So I think there was already, Sam already referred to the challenges. We did, in preparing the strategy, we did an, um, some analysis of the um, landfill capacity for residual waste. The colour coding here shows metropolitan levy area, which is in blue, the regional level levy area in purple, and then the non-levied area, which is uh, more remote regional, which is in green. So that's referring to the um, New South Wales waste levy. And you can see here, just as a couple examples, that the um, Greater Sydney non-putrescible landfill is expected to expire later this decade, the ca capacity, and the Greater Sydney putrescible landfill, so that's where most domestic waste goes, um, we may run out of space by 2036. This is on the assumption that waste generation continues to increase um, at the current rates, and it is projected to increase by about 16% by 2040 if we don't take steps to address that. So um, also really important that we've got the right infrastructure for recycling and resource recovery. We're going to move much more to a circular economy. And so we also undertook analysis of that for Greater Sydney and the rest of New South Wales. And you can see here that um, capacity again is quite wanting. There's only perhaps glass is well served and material recovery facilities in Greater Sydney have sufficient infrastructure to 2030. But all other areas of recycling resource recovery will require improvements to um, infrastructure to meet our needs by 2030. So that is a big area of focus of the strategy. So in the strategy on infrastructure, um, next slide please, we are undertaking a number of initiatives. And I should say when I say we, this is very much joint work between the Environment Protection Authority and the department. So taking a strategic approach to the critical waste infrastructure, um, not just letting it evolve organically, but actually determining where are the best places to locate infrastructure, how can we integrate that with um, re you know, strategic planning? How can we provide support to get the infrastructure in the right places and the right kind of infrastructure? Uh, we've also got a project, and I think Monica will refer to something um, relevant to this, to help local governments to jointly procure waste services at scale. And this is important, not just because it will help them to save money by a much stronger purchasing power, but also to think strategically about what infrastructure is needed and to be able to um, support a much more strategic approach to managing waste. And associated with that, we'll also be reviewing and updating the planning instrument. So it's um, not directly funding the infrastructure, but taking a very proactive and strategic approach to that infrastructure, to supporting the infrastructure development. Next slide, please. So the moving on, the, so the second focus area is this focus on carbon. The bar chart on the left shows the um, dis current distribution of uh, the emissions profile for New South Wales, with the over half currently being from stationary energy, but of course that will decrease as we increase our renewables um, in the energy sector. And you can see that waste is quite a small component of that uh, for the direct emissions. Nevertheless, if we think about the programs we are um, putting in place across all these sectors, they will all contribute to reducing um, to, to a more circular economy, as well as reducing carbon from waste by designing out waste, keeping the products and materials in use. And of course, ultimately um, using natural systems to actually sequester carbon, which can also link that to the use of um, organics, keeping organics out of landfill. And I just put one example of, um, of the carbon value of, of recycling on this, which is aluminium, which is one of the stronger ones, but you can see that um, the emissions for uh, um, kind of a ton of aluminium that's recycled can avoid 16.6 kilograms of, of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that can rapidly lead to very significant carbon savings. So we have a number of programs in the, um, in the strategy that, and indeed in the related net zero plan that will help to reduce carbon emissions through better waste and materials management. So a big focus on food and garden organics and a significant investment of 65 million to um, support the rollout of new uh, organics collection services with local government across the state. Um, and then a component of that also putting uh, investment into food donation infrastructure and equipment. So that's for, to support um, large supermarkets and other entities, um, food businesses that may be generating a lot of food waste. 
um, increasing the ability to actually, um, I don't think you can say recycle, but reuse that by donating it. Uh, now we're going to, another very strong lever that we have is government procurement. So the government spends billions of dollars on procurement every year and have a, has a very powerful lever. And we will be mandating that um, uh, recycled content has to be preferred in procurement. So we're working, starting to implement that there now. And we've got great enthusiasm across government already. So Transport for New South Wales, for instance, already use considerable recycled material in their road base. But by um, embedding that in our procurement, then we can identify roadblocks to a more circular economy. We can develop new, new markets for recycled products and also address some of the um, maybe technical or bi price barriers that might be prohibiting use of those materials at the moment. And then um, I guess supporting that, we'll have a number of programs, grants and industry uh, participation programs that incentivize and will regulate circular economy approaches to reduce emissions. And finally, um, the last focus area is continuing to maintain a strong um, you know, regulatory and uh, behavioral change approach to minimizing the direct impact of waste on the environment. This is largely led by the Environment Protection Authority and will continue support for things like uh, list reduction activities, the, the very popular community recycling centers, household chemical clean out events, I'm sure we'll all look forward to resuming, uh, combating illegal dumping, um, work to manage waste in some of the very remote communities, particularly Aboriginal communities, and uh, more support for regional landfills. So we have a number of um, targets in the strategy that are derived, next slide please. Oh, sorry, I've skipped over this one. Um, this, you know, go back to the Plastics Action Plan. So the Plastics is very, Plastics Action Plan was a, it's part of the Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy, but it was important enough to have its own plan. It's going to be addressing plastic at all points of the plastics life cycle, and it's probably the best example of how we're really going to move heavily into thinking of a more circular economy. So we're preparing legislation now to phase out single use and problematic and unnecessary plastics. And also thinking not how not do we how do we just ban them, but how do we work with producers to just to phase out, you know, upstream um, some of these these products to get better design principles to uh, introduce um, circular principles and to improve product stewardship so that we, the producers now have responsibility for this material all the way through. And one of the areas we'll be looking at is cigarette butts, which continue to be the highest littered um, thing in New South Wales. So next slide, wrap up quickly. We have a number of targets in the strategy. Many of these on the left-hand side are directly the ones that have been agreed to at the national level. So there is a national waste action plan and we've adopted these as New South Wales targets um, we have a number of additional targets on the right hand side, and then we'll also be doing work to get new metrics and this is where we collaborate closely with our colleagues at New South Wales Circular, new metrics to understand um, the, you know, the use, reuse of, use of recycled content and so on, and how we're actually transitioning to a circular economy. And the final slide is just to show you that there's a whole range of um, programs now and strategies coming out from the New South Wales government, all of which adopts circular economy thinking and principles. And that's actually why we ended up not calling it the circular economy strategy, because it was felt across government that, that it's becoming such a widely adopted concept and principle that we didn't want to, to put the message out that circular economy was only covered by the strategy. It's actually becoming embedded in many um, initiatives for economic development, um, the design and place set that's still being developed, but we'll look at circular economy embedded into uh, design and so on. So I'll finish it there and hope I've been able to give you a bit of an overview. Thank you. That's really great, Kate, and and thank you for uh, sort of ending on the on the focus on on circular economy, which we're going to um, move into towards um, with the, the latter couple of speakers. But but I want to kind of focus more on this the partnership with local government that you talked about and this focus on halving. Um, organic waste by 2030, which is a big target. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, organic waste by 2030 and, and the role of local government in doing that. And so inviting Monica Baroni to um, share the Very from local good. government. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Sam. Thank you, Kate, for that fantastic overview. And um, thank you to the Committee for Sydney for inviting me for this, to, um, this opportunity to speak about this really important topic. Today, I want to use my time to just really make one point. The point I want to contribute and leave you with is this. As leaders, our call to action should be to do everything we can to assist the New South Wales Government, the Department of Environment and the EPA and our local councils to achieve the goals in the New South Wales Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy. This strategy means we finally have a plan. Our colleagues in the state government know what to do, as do the waste planners, educators and engineers in our councils. The community is keen for change. The issue is no longer what shall we do. The issue is how do we collaborate to achieve urgent action? I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the city of Sydney is on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And as I do also acknowledge that our indigenous community have always known how to live sustainably on this planet. We have so much to learn from them about sustainable resource management. This plan fills me with optimism, it's bold, it's progressive, and it's achievable. Most importantly, it outlines a positive future, a future where we, have, we will have data-driven decision-making, where we take responsibility for our waste and where we move towards a circular economy. Firstly and significantly, if we pull together and do a proper job, it would lead to Sydney and New South Wales being a place where we actually know how much waste we produce and where we take responsibility for that waste. A principle we use to guide our work at the City of Sydney and our work with other councils is to demand access to the data. We're also committed to developing policies that ensure our waste is processed as close as possible to where it is generated. It is an outrage that we have been operating without accurate data and without a clear line of sight as to where our waste goes and what happens to it. I think one of the best things that has happened in recent times was when China, followed by other countries, announced they would no longer take our waste to process. The media has done a terrific job exposing what is really going on. Australians who dutifully separated their waste into the various recycling, recycling bins were shocked to discover how much of this so-called recycling was actually being stockpiled with no real use, shipped overseas to hopefully be recycled, or worse still, as is the case with textile waste, shipped overseas and then thrown into the ocean at someone else's doorstep. A recent study found that only 17% of the textiles our communities are taking to charity outlets are actually being reused. So I'm delighted that the strategy is data driven so that we can account for our waste. And I'm delighted that we're working on implementation plans that will see us take responsibility for our own waste so it is no longer out of sight and out of mind. The second opportunity that this plan provides is one that over time will see Sydney move towards a circular economy, an economy ensuring that every resource is continuously used and reused, moving towards a regenerative city. What this work has shown us that is that like so many of our wicked problems, we have the solutions, we have the know-how and the technology. What we don't always have is the social license to operate. We can only achieve this in partnership with our community. Yes, our community is receptive, but only to a point. Most people accept something needs to happen, but the deep behavioural change required, coupled with an acceptance of the need for infrastructure, such as aerob aerobic digest anaerobic digestion for food waste, obviously producing you know, biogas and compost, or waste to energy, is still, are still technologies that are far from accepted. That's why we need all hands on deck. Local government, given its close relationship with its community and its role in dealing with all domestic waste and much construction waste, is one very important set of boots on the ground. With this in mind, about two years ago, I volunteered to chair the SS Rock Waste Working Group. SS Rock represents 11 councils and about 20% of all the waste generated in New South Wales. All of our policies and projects align to the Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy. I don't have time to go into the detail, but I'm just going to give one example of why, like all urban problems, the solutions are place-based and can only be solved in close collaboration with local government. The strategy says that all food and organic waste must be out of the waste stream or the red bin, or about half of it, by 2030. This is because food waste in our landfill uh, creates methane, which of course is a very potent greenhouse gas. 
our SS Rock study, which has looked at how this can be done across metropolitan Sydney, has calculated that the educational component alone is extremely expensive. Why is this? It's because the solution is different depending on the demography and urban form of the area, coupled with the processing and disposable facilities. So different communities will have different services and all residents and business need to be educated in using these services. Before I elaborate, let me tell you about a program we instituted at the City of Sydney organisation to separate food waste in our own buildings. Let me set the scene. I'm very passionate about managing waste. Staff tell me that they are terrified of getting into the lift with me if they have a disposable coffee cup or plastic cutlery because I tell them to go and get a keep cup or I remind them that we've put cutlery on every floor so they don't need single use plastic. So it is against this backdrop that we decided to train all our staff on how to use the food waste bins on each floor. After we were all trained, the service was introduced. On day one, I went to check the bins and I found a plastic bag with some bread in the red bin. I took it out, went out to my floor and said, who put this in the red bin instead of the food waste bin? The reply was, oh, I thought since it was in soft plastic, it went in the red bin. I patiently explained that, the plain, explained that the bread was organic and it needed to be removed from the bag. Bread in food waste bin, plastic in red bin. The next day, I found a plastic bag of rocket in the red bin. I took it out onto the, out onto the floor and I held it up. Who put this in the red bin and why, I asked. The reply was, the rocket was rotten, so red bin, right? I patiently explained that the food waste bin wasn't for fresh food, it was for unusable food like rotten rocket. Rocket in food waste bin, plastic bag in red bin. Now, everyone on my floor knows my passion for this. Everyone has been trained, everyone is proficient in English, and everyone has a degree. I'm sure you're getting the point I'm trying to make. Most local government areas have low, medium and high density housing, as well as commercial premises that generate food waste. If your residents live in detached housing, you can offer a variety of solutions. You can educate people to compost or worm farm. You can offer a separate bin for food waste because they have somewhere to store it. But if your residents live in terrace houses with no backyard or lane, there is no place for a compost or a worm farm. And often there isn't even room for the existing red, blue and yellow bin. Even if there was room for a food waste bin, food waste left outside quickly smells terrible and attracts insects and vermin. We also can't send trucks every day through narrow congested streets to pick up small amounts of food waste. We need solutions that can store food waste in a way that manages odours and can be stored for a number of days. If your residents live in apartments, especially where people do not own the apartment, you are educating people who do not directly pay the waste charge that the council levies. So unless you are personally motivated, you have no incentive to reduce your waste to bring down your charge or manage a, municip a multiplicity of waste disposal methods. And then there's the issue of language barriers, cultural practices, commercial premises such as rest restaurants that are not even controlled by council. And food is just one of the many waste streams that must be addressed. I think you get the picture. We can do it, but it's going to take a lot of effort. So that's my call to action. We need to do everything we can to support this reform, but we can only do it if we work together. And that's where we, all of us here, come in business, local government and state government and industry taking our customers and community on this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. A, a real kind of first-hand experience, not only from, from yourself, but also from, from the local government experience of trying to create the behaviour change to deliver on the strategy. Now, you also said that um, all solutions are place-based and I want to hand over to Richard Kirkman from Veolia to talk about the, the ways in which Veolia is contributing to the, um, the, waste, the waste challenges that we're facing here in Sydney. Richard. Thanks, uh, Sam. That was, that was great, Monica. Remind me never to come and work at your office. I'd be terrified of putting something in the wrong bin. Um, but I, I think I'm going to talk about very similar uh, scope, which is how do we get there and um, what do we all need to do? I think I'd start by saying, you know, we all produce wastes. 
wastes are really just materials flowing through our lives that we're using for something for varying amounts of time, either packaging very short term or building materials very long term. And one day they, we don't want them anymore. Um, and it's all about how we can manage those materials better. And that's what we mean when we talk about a circular economy. Um, and to really talk about a circular economy, we need to talk about um, solid materials, uh, energy and water, because all those things um, are kind of relevant. Um, and those pathways to treating waste better will lead to us being able to uh, reduce carbon emissions and protect biodiversity and have better environmental and health prospects for the country. So it kind of is really fundamental to quality of life. Um, first, just about Veolia. So we're a, we're a large organisation, been around over 100 years, about 180,000 people globally. But in Australia, it's 5,000 people. And we provide services to, to treat wastes, uh, clean water, either wastewater or produced drinking water, and uh, local loops of energy use, so renewable energy. Um, so we don't really produce our own waste, or so, you know, we consume a bit of energy and a bit of, produce a bit of waste at our offices, but it's really a service provider trying to, everything we do is about trying to improve something for industry or household uh, waste or water or energy. So I think there are three big limbs to how we can uh, get to an 80% recovery from where we are today. Um, if I start on the, the, the right hand side, as you look at this, uh, the first one is around organic materials, food and organic materials. Um, and that has a huge potential for carbon savings and producing bioenergy and fertilizers. Uh, the middle piece here is around designing products better. And that will allow us to prevent waste in the first place, enable reuse schemes, um, refill schemes, and also recycle better and make it easier for consumers. And the third part is around energy from waste in one of two ways, either thermal recovery from residual waste or recovery of energy from food waste. So they're the three things I'd like to just unpick with a, a, a comment on each. So let me start with energy from waste. It's, it's probably the most controversial to Australia because it's completely new. It, <coughs> excuse me. It has been developed extensively elsewhere. Um, I, I was involved in the construction of 10 of these facilities in the UK and Veolia Group has built 65 units. Um, in a nutshell, this technology is, is about using residual non-recyclable waste as a fuel instead of a fossil fuel. So a typical coal-fired power station uh, will put coal in a box. That box has walls of water and tubes and you heat the coal and it heats the water and that water turns to steam. And that steam, steam drives a turbine and that turbine by turning produces electricity. And what we're doing here is we're replacing the coal, a highly carbon intensive fuel with waste, which is residual household waste, which has a higher organic content, um, a higher renewability intensity. Um, and with a lot of flue gas treatment and new technology, we can do this um, safely and cleanly. So it's a better way of doing things and it reduces the landfill emissions that would otherwise come from that waste. The other way to get energy from waste is to separate the food. And we propose to do this first. Um, and if you do that, you can, you can get clean energy and use the, uh, the food that comes out of the back end as fertilizer. And this fits into the waste hierarchy here. This is a well tried and tested way of thinking about how we manage our wastes. Um, and we need a bit of all of them, right? It's not like we can just choose one of these and say we're gonna only do that. First of all, we need to avoid as much waste as we can and that comes through good design. Then we should reuse materials more than once. So Monica mentioned the keep cup. Then if we can't reuse it, we recycle materials. And there will be some things that are not viably recycled. Uh, and that's where we think energy from waste comes in. And from that, we get energy, water, metals recovered, and aggregates or fertilizer, depending on the technology we're using. And of course, we do get 25% of materials recycled when we do the energy recovery route. And then down there at the bottom of the hierarchy is treating some wastes, maybe hazardous wastes or medical wastes, and disposing of waste. So we need all these in our kit bag in order to treat the different types of materials that we produce. If I move on to the whole product design piece and how we can improve the way we um, uh, ensure our materials are recyclable and have recycled content, I think the big missing link here 
is how we just get this circle going all the way from manufacturer. Today, people buy things, the consumers, and then the consumers, we all put things in our household bins out in the street and it's collected and it's either disposed or recycled. But getting that loop back around to manufacturers is really challenging. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that the councils are paying for the disposal of waste, the manufacturers aren't directly paying. So the incentives uh, for a council to change the way things are made in order to make them more recyclable don't exist because they aren't the manufacturer. And we think changing this system somehow um, would benefit. And I, I personally think a kind of pay as you buy approach would work. If you think about when you buy a product today, if you buy a bottle of milk, you, you pay for the milk, you pay for the bottle, you pay for the transport, you pay for the energy, the lighting in the factory where it's made, you pay for everything to do with that bottle of milk, but you don't pay for whether it's recycled or reused or disposed. And that's a bit odd, isn't it? That you're buying something and then generally the population is on average paying for that. So maybe some kind of scheme normally called uh, producer responsibility, where there's a direct payment would allow us to uh, put this loop in place. And then finally, the, the food on organics, incredibly important part because it's very high carbon value. Um, first stop is not to produce so much food waste. We do produce a lot of food waste, but even if you've, you know, you're throwing things away that maybe uh, could have been eaten. There are some things that can't be eaten. So coffee grinds and eggshells and tea bags and banana skins. Um, and, you know, ultimately food is a fuel source. It's a fuel source for us, but if we can't eat it, it can be a fuel source for us to produce electricity. And then the, the residues coming off of that can be turned into fertilizers. And what these changes will make and the, the policy that's been set out by New South Wales government do deliver these changes uh, will mean that we can protect the environment. And this is about protecting us from more frequent flooding, bushfires, damage to the ocean and harsh weather conditions. That's the real outcome of making these changes and moving away from what we currently do, which is to not recycle enough and to landfill everything else. And then finally, just bringing that down to what I think uh, you can do to help. There is some skepticism about energy from waste because it's new. I think there's evidence overseas that it's safe and it would be um, useful for us to have these discussions. And I'm very ready to share information about uh, this technology to show that it is safe. For recyclability, I think we have movement to be made across the supply chain with manufacturers maybe labeling things better. You know, it's all very well trying to determine what, what bin to put your recyclable in, but it doesn't normally come down to the color of the bin. It normally comes down to the product in your hand and knowing if it's a recyclable item or not. And then adoption of FOGO early, because I think waiting to 2030 may be too late. And my advice to uh, local authorities would be that it doesn't work straight away and you have to keep at it and you have to keep communicating, you have to keep going. And I think, you know, Monica kind of was talking along the same lines, and that was the same case with recycling. People didn't really know how to do recycling initially, and we kind of were getting there in the end. Um, it's, it's an incredibly emotive topic, waste, and how to manage it. And you know, I'm, I'm really keen that we answer as many of people's questions as we can so that we can uh, get the best outcomes for communities and for the environment. I'm going to stop there, I think, because I, I've probably taken all my time off. Thank you very much, Richard. That, that's great and a really, um, really great insight uh, into the kind of recovery side, I guess, which um, you know, which is really crucial to, to hitting some of those targets uh, and to to um, yeah, getting the, the benefit, I guess, the value out of out of the waste streams. So, one of the things that Richard talked about and has been talked about all the way through is is the role of the the circular economy. And and we've we've got um, Lisa McLean here to to really talk about what that opportunity looks like, um, you know, here in in Sydney and, and New South Wales. Lisa, thanks, Sam. And just as I had to start talking, we got a big storm, so you'll have you'll hear some hailstones or something on my roof. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Richard, Monica, and Kate. Excellent presentations, and I think um, emphasising the importance of data driven strategy and data for the market is just so important. 
I want to talk about circular economy. I, first, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming from the um, lands of the Wallamadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So circular economy for us at New South Wales Circular is really way bigger than waste. It's our what is that new economic framework that can enable us to generate jobs, to um, grow new industries and innovation, create investment in a resource constrained, carbon constrained future. And for us, it is very much about uh, understanding how we can decouple economic growth from that virgin resource use. And there's just so much to learn here. You know, we know that um, Australians, to, to Monica's point, we got a bad habit of throwing stuff away. We haven't had a lot of, um, a lot of our um, infrastructure and linear systems are business models that support that, whether that's water, whether that's energy or waste, uh, are sitting around 75 to 100 years old. So we're very much, um, we're very good at sort of flushing away and throwing away. And you can see here some of the figures. We're way behind a lot of the European countries in harnessing that those um, resource opportunities that um, the previous speakers have all talked about. Um, and on top of that, Australia is a really big material user per capita. You can see here we're second largest in the OECD, which is pretty significant. So we've got a real addiction to um, consuming. And one of the things that New South Wales Circular is really trying to raise awareness around is that we do need to change our relationship to consumption. It doesn't mean we have to stop getting what we need. We can still get what we need. But we've really got to start to put in place those policy frameworks, which Kate's um, beautifully articulated, and I really support Monica's comments about this strategy. We've got a framework, as Monica knows, we've got to measure it. If we can't measure it, we can't set targets and we can't actually move towards transition towards new opportunities. But we've got a real opportunity here to create catalyze a market to generate new business models um, that can Pro, that can choose the right materials that are regenerative, that aren't toxic, that can stay in our economy over and over again to extract value and grow jobs. And the um, I know Kate touched on this, but I just want to present it again to everybody. Circular economy is so important. We cannot get to zero carbon without it. You know, 55% and people like um, Zali Stegel and others have told me that perhaps our energy transition in New South Wales, our energy efficiency might get us more like 60, 70% to reducing those emissions we need to reduce for Paris. But we've still got a big chunk here, um, around 45% that's embedded in our um, materials. As, as Kate said, it's in, our, um, it's in the use and management of materials and products. So it's got a really big role to play here. And um, it's a great um, narrative for, for governments as they're looking to embrace uh, this new economy, this new resource constrained and carbon constrained economy, because, you know, it's a big opportunity. We've had some um, analysis done here in Australia, sitting at almost close to $2 trillion um, economic boost over the next couple of decades. And New South Wales Circular, we think those numbers are going to go up. The jobs numbers are going to go up. The economic opportunity is going to go up and the, as the waste reduction comes down. And as we start to see these opportunities right across the economy, not just in waste, not just in water, not just in energy, but right across the economy for us to um, embrace circularity. Our vision at New South Wales Circular was set up with a grant from the Office of Chief Scientist and Engineer. Um, we're very a unique um, collaborative framework. We bring together researchers, we bring together industry and work with government to fast track that transition to a circular economy. And we're really focusing in three areas. We've got economics, circular economics, metrics and benchmarking as a key pillar. And to that end, we've appointed Australia's first chief circular economist, Dr. Kame Tang. And I'd encourage you all to um, look at where you can appoint a circular economist um, to think about how we start valuing externalities. How do we um, examine and build business cases and understand the cash flow of circular business models? They're quite different from... Uh, linear business models and often our regulators don't understand that cash flow and they don't understand the market settings for sharing and reuse so big opportunities here um, for us to to build awareness and knowledge and data around that the metrics and benchmarking is super important as I mentioned before and uh, just a nod to, to Kate and Monica because you know we have to be able to measure 
We need the data. We need to know where these resources are. How do we map them? How do we identify them so that other companies can leverage that resource stream rather than it going straight to landfill or incineration, which is just our default at the moment. And I'm going to talk about a hospital plastics program we just launched in a sec. I just will mention the two other streams here. Supply chains is absolutely critical. We're really keen to do this work. It's really hard. It's really gritty work, putting our arms around uh, industry, government and researchers to create new supply chains, but it's just super critical. Um, we, we don't can't make those pieces meet at the moment. There is a market failing in many cases, so we need to intervene in this space and New South Wales has kind of got the grit to do that. The final area is around research and collaboration. Uh, we're not going to get to circular economy without collaboration. Um, we have brought together a number of task forces as a way to, because it's it's a massive systems transition, the circular economy. Um, we have our New South Wales Government Task Force, which is chaired by Kate Wilson, um, who we just heard from. We've got a finance one with all the big banks looking at um, circular bonds, how we value um, assets, circular assets. We have a research task force with New South Wales researchers. We have a national task force, actually. It's a forum with all the states and territories uh, and the federal government, which is moving along really well as a forum for circularity beyond just waste. And we have um, had hosted the our events, been hosted by Victoria and South Australia, be soon hosted by Queensland. We have an infrastructure task force a policy one and a citizens one. So we've broken off these big gritty pieces and we've got our task forces really honing in on those problems, um, sectoral areas for reform and barriers around circular economy. And we're always interested in members to our task forces. So you can go to our website and you can see more information there. So this big piece just quickly and wrapping up around how we actually move from linear to circular. I wanna talk about our supply chain focuses, plastics, Organics, of course, textiles and end of life solar panels. Plastics was our first big one. We just launched it two days ago. You might have seen some news around that. It was a partnership um, with St. Vincent's Hospital, with um, University of New South Wales and a, and a manufacturer from Orange called All Moulds Plastic. Not a big one, just a small company in regional New South Wales. And what we were able to do is collect um, needle caps and ampules from um, I'll just duck down to the picture here, needle caps and ampules from a number of wards in St. Vincent's. And it was led by a phenomenal fellow called Rodrigo. You can see him there smiling in the, the middle picture. He's a nurse um, and who was just fed up with the waste. And of, of course, that's been exacerbated by COVID. Um, and he started to collect, create clean stream collection points. And what New South Wales Circular did is bring in all the missing pieces. We brought in the circular um, manufacturers with ore moulds who came in and picked up this clean stream waste and turned it into um, things like wheels for roller doors. You can see at the very end there, uh, Scott's holding one of them, but also components for wind farms as well. So we created a small supply chain. And now what we're looking to do is how we can scale that, how we can grow that, not just across New South Wales, but across Australia. And we launched this program um, yesterday. And as I mentioned, it's, it's been very well received. Um, the amount of plastic that um, is produced by hospitals is pretty massive. It, it could weigh, every year it weighs about the same as the uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, and we know that just by collecting, you know, around 50%, 40 to 60%, we could create savings equivalent to hiring 40 new nurses or putting that money back into patient care. So there's a really big opportunity here. And what we're trying to highlight um, with our supply chain program and our work is how does it work? How do you create these new circular supply chains and where are those opportunities to leverage? And of course, we need more data. Um, so we're, we're focused on building a new database around this. Um, ideally, where we'd like to be is working with governments to um, create accessible data because a lot of organisations like hospitals don't even know that they've got these rich resources in, in their waste streams at the moment. Um, so how do we build awareness around that? Um, how do we work with um, the waste management industry to um, continue to create jobs and opportunities but keep the right components in the economy longer to create jobs? The last bit I just want to show here is our benchmarking work. Very proud of it. We'll be launching that soon um, with councils. Uh, but the benchmarking tools that we've created can be used in precincts. Um, and we're just helping to do that measurement, helping councils 
measure what they're doing, not just in waste, but maybe in water, in shared mobility and other areas of the circular economy. So thanks very much, Sam, and, and I'll um, look forward to some questions after. Thanks, Lisa. That was really great. And some really practical, you know, examples of how you are actually delivering on this, you know, this grand concept that, um, that a lot of people struggle to get their hands around and, and seeing those examples is really helpful. Um, and, and sort of highlighting the importance of data in, in all of these components is actually, you know, not just, just, just in terms of valuing the waste streams, but, um, but actually in terms of measuring and, and setting those targets and getting towards them. Um, so our last speaker is Ali Abbas, he's, he's, um, I've already introduced him, but he's really going to go into some of the, the, the research kind of sides, the, the innovation pipeline, uh, I guess, around uh, how do we actually make this transition to a circular economy uh, in practice and the work that's going on. Um, I'll hand over to you, Ali. Thank you, Sam. And good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'll spend uh, the next uh, few minutes talking to you about uh, innovation pipeline for translating the circular economy. I'm uh, from the University of Sydney at uh, the Waste Transformation Research Hub. Um, so I'm from chemical engineering. So this is something related to what we teach in the first year chemical engineering to our engineering students. We teach energy balances and uh, materials balances. But I want to highlight here this nexus between energy and materials and, and waste, uh, of course, and emissions comes to that. Um, what I highlight here is that there is a very close relationship between energy and materials, and therefore also the generated waste. And if we are looking at the renewables energy sector, which is moving very fast and, and steaming ahead, which is great and fantastic, we also need to consider the materials uh, um, in tandem with energy. What the middle data shows you here, this need for increased uh, materials in concrete, steel, aluminium, copper, glass, and so on going towards 2050. All of those materials are uh, extracted uh, from nature and, and resources from nature, and we need them for building the wind turbines and, and the solar panels and so on. And consider this, that we are globally now only at 10% penetration in uh, terms of uh, the share of wind and solar in the world for electricity generation. And on the right here, you could also reflect on all the materials around us. So, so often we have good conversations in terms of emissions and net zero on energy, but it certainly, as many of the speakers reflected earlier, relates to um, materials uh, as well. So there's plenty of uh, work there to be done. I won't spend much time on defining the circular economy or going around uh, uh, explaining it, but I want to just highlight uh, and thanks to the previous speakers who have uh, introduced it. But I wanted to highlight the, the fact that I, I consider the, the, the design step in the circular economy to be the most profound of the, the, the steps here. So I'll talk a lot about that and, uh, as I go. And, and of course, the linear economy, you can think of it as all these straight lines from the resources in nature all the way to the disposal. The circular economy, as the EPA of New South Wales have depicted it here in this right diagram on the right, you see more of these circles, the circulation of materials. So I, I've also been looking at circular economy for a number of years, and, and it is uh, uh, an area that keeps popping up in terms of its actual understanding and definitions. There is, there is a report that has collected all these definitions from around the world. There's, in that report, there's 114 different definitions of the circular economy. So I, I, I challenge you to kind of uh, check your own definition and your understanding and, and how, what the circular economy is and how it works. A few years back in 2018, we held the, the first Australian circular economy conference. And in that conference, we also asked that question to the attendees who were 70% from industry. And uh, the begin, at the beginning of the conference, we asked that question and, and many of them answered in different ways. Recycling popped up to be the answer or the most dominant answer. At the end of that conference, we asked that same question again, and design came out to be dominant, and also not to forget reuse here. So, you know, over those years, I've been thinking about circular economy and, and thinking about its uh, definition from my perspective. And here is one uh, that I defined to you. It is for me about design, as I said earlier, about advanced manufacturing and reuse, less about recycling. 
so waste uh, over those years we've been setting up our innovation uh, hub our waste transformation research hub focused on waste and building capacity to support the industry the waste sector and we formed it from feedback from the industry in these verticals water or wastewater carbon and this is where plastics are minerals and this is where the inorganics e-waste and ash are but also importantly we have these cross-cutting horizontals process systems engineering which is a uh, it is the core technology innovation or innovations that we apply to solve these problems in these verticals along with transition pathways to impact so what is this process systems engineering it is uh, a sub-discipline in chemical engineering it allows us to deal with things in a systems way, systems thinking across uh, length scales and time scales. And also we, we start to develop uh, through these multiple, multiple scale solutions uh, across the uh, TRL scales from research all the way to development and, uh, and uh, further deployment, RD&D. Of, we, we focus very much in the hub on industry. We focus on solutions to the, we are very closely working with the industry and, and also uh, spinning off companies and working with startups and scale ups along the way to get these innovations uh, up and away. In terms of some of these innovations or the innovation, some, I'll, I'll share some uh, um, projects and just to give a flavor of the, the kind of work that is done there in terms of this innovation pipeline and thinking through the construction sector which uh, was mentioned earlier as an important sector where there is uh, quite a heavy use of concrete an important material that is uh, energy intensive therefore embodied carbon uh, is, is very high in those materials so again we think about design we think about manufacturing and reuse in that sector and how we can develop solutions, circular solution to design products for the construction industry that uh, optimize the properties of the product while incorporating waste in them uh, and including carbon dioxide. And we've done that, we've uh, created a uh, recipe, multiple recipes. One of them in, in fact is, is a high uh, structural strength uh, at 77 MPA and uh, and we have also now taken these recipes into the commercial world a, a, a company is licensing licensing this recipe uh, and, uh, and working with the local councils on on eco pavements of course some other work there that you can see in the top right of the slide we're looking at uh, advanced manufacturing using concrete recipes a second uh, um, project if you like or idea to, to share with you here in terms of how we think about circular design is solar panels this picture gives you an example we've got a very strong uh, uptake of solar panels on our rooftops in australia it's one of the leading uh, countries in the world in that in that regard and and you can see here in terms of the projected waste that is going to emerge from this sector over the years to 2050 on the in the chart on the top right so Solar panels are products, solar panel systems are, are multiple products involved in those. And, and one uh, can do a life cycle analysis to understand that product and, and look at its inventory of materials from the glass, the copper, the metals, and also the, the polymers and, and, uh, and so on across its uh, life cycle. And we can look at system boundary. We've done that recently to, on solar panels, but focused on the importance or the impact of recycling uh, in that uh, sector of, of those solar panels so we've taken and there's not many you know much innovation out there in terms of recycling solar panels there there's uh, very few uh, work uh, going on in terms of how they are recycled these solar panels we've assessed two existing processes and we've assessed them for, against landfill as a benchmark what it turns out to be from this life cycle assessment that compares these recycling methods versus landfill is that the recycling is not itself much, uh, it's not providing uh, much improvement in terms of the impact, the positive impact on the environment. It is better than landfilling, but only incrementally better. better. So that begs the question of how can we think about solar panels and solar panel systems in the future? 
What we didn't also include in this analysis is the uh, impact for, on the environment from establishing the solar panel facility, recycling facilities. So, and if we did that, that uh, uh, you know, could bring the impact on par with landfill. So th there are questions there for that industry in terms of how can we design those products uh, to be much more sustainable, much more circular. And we're, we're trying to do that with one project here, looking at developing a, uh, a solar uh, roof tile that has multiple functions. And, and uh, these functions are, it's a roof tile, it collects uh, elect uh, uh, solar PV, but also it collects heat and uh, distributes that to the household. And in this way, we can bring efficiency of the product to a higher level and uh, bring its circularity uh, um, even higher by including uh, cheap, abundant waste materials, such as plastics, for example, into the tile. Now, we're working to innovate in this regard to develop the heat storage material. We call this the heat battery, our heat battery project. And it's, uh, uh, we, the innovation there is in that material that goes inside the the heat, uh, the, the solar roof tile. Another project here, and, uh, and this is about modeling and starting to go into the digital innovations and uh, developing uh, models for entire precincts, including precincts such as industrial eco parks, such as the, the special activation precincts uh, that are happening in New South Wales. And these apply also to, to precincts in uh, local districts or in cities and uh, business parks and so on. Effectively, what this looks at is incorporating all the tenants or the players within that boundary of that uh, precinct and looking at them in a systems view and addressing that from a modeling perspective. Again, going back to those materials and energy balances equations that we can uh, model those systems with, but then we can connect all those systems together from a power perspective or from a water perspective or from a carbon perspective and, and, uh, or from a materials perspective. So we can look at all the flows of materials going in, all the products being pulled by the market, and we can create a, um, an optimized design of the precinct, or we can optimize its operation by routing, for example, carbon around and utilizing carbon in the precinct. So we, we've done that uh, preliminary modeling, uh, established that framework, and we've assessed it for an, a hypothetical um, eco park, industrial eco park under different scenarios shown here from say 100% fossil fuel scenario all the way to 100% renewable scenario. And you can create multiple scenarios in between, solve it through this software, and you could see the emissions reductions, the significant reductions that one can achieve by this industrial ecology consortium within the um, boundary of that park. So that, that is interesting work and we're, we're very pleased to be uh, also working with, with Lisa and colleagues at New South Wales Circular on that uh, project for uh, Parks uh, SAP. So back to process systems engineering, that kind of innovation pipeline of using process CPAC. And the idea here is to utilize algorithms to determine what best materials to use and what are the best mixes of materials to use in terms of designing the products. This goes back to that point that Richard was mentioning early, earlier on product design. So we can reverse engineer products these days. We can access computer power, we can access advanced algorithms, we can develop those and we can reverse engineer these products. But on top of that, we can, well, while we do that, we can add the circular economy design objective. And that is quite important. And here, these, this objective could be to lower emissions. It could be to uh, increase the incorporation of particular recycling uh, components into the material, et cetera, et cetera. But importantly, also, we could restrict with our uh, optimization the, the use of uh, emerging contaminants, for example, or materials that lead to emerging contaminants. And, and that is, for instance, we're starting to to incorporate policy into the algorithm, if you like, if you think, think of it that way. And one, one uh, idea I, I uh, uh, floated around was about having a circular economy certification scheme for these products. And effectively what that does, it looks at these nasty chemicals, nasty ingredients that can enter the economy through these products and ensure that they don't by uh, policy uh, uh, mechanisms. 
A final example here is I uh, talk about energy from waste and as energy and materials, again, that nexus here is, is exemplified in this uh, case study uh, and a company called, uh, a new company called Simtech Hydrogen, which has recently been established as a joint venture here locally in Sydney between Simita Ventures and Kinaltech uh, uh, local companies. Uh, and I am uh, disclosing here, I am uh, director and founder of Simita Ventures. And what this technology does, it takes um, uh, innovations in the digital algorithms to design catalysts uh, using Kinaltech's proprietary catalyst materials and design the uh, process to convert, to convert landfill biogas into hydrogen. So we can have renewable hydrogen accessible for decarbonizing the landfills, but also for, for the, from the fugitive emissions, but also to decarbonize transport. So such innovation comes in terms of the product design again, which is the catalyst system. It's the technology, circular technology design, circular product design also has to come, and I haven't mentioned that much, with circular business design. And this is where the, the catalyst system uh, of Simtech becomes core to a business solution that we call the East Coast Hydrogen Corridor, which is linking major cities on the East Coast of Australia, major routes for transport, and looking at connecting them through landfill sites, key landfill sites, and accessing the, the methane, the biogas from those landfill sites with the Simtech technology to produce hydrogen and set up hydrogen refueling stations for accessing the um, hydrogen for transport. Then those, those heavy vehicle trucks, such as the uh, local council uh, trucks for, for waste transport or for heavy vehicle transport across the highways. And this technology is exemplified, is shown here in this illustration. Renewable methane comes from the landfill and, and we use some water in there to feed it into the system. Uh, we produce green hydrogen. We also end up with biogenic CO2 and that CO2 can then be used in those applications such as the one I mentioned earlier in concrete. We can feed that to the concrete mix uh, and uh, develop uh, low carbon concretes. It can also be used in um, uh, other applications such as in uh, uh, agriculture and so on. But the key innovation, a local solution is this Syntec reactor that uh, converts the um, biogas into hydrogen. And because we use this innovation in digital algorithms, we can design that catalyst to work at much lower temperature than the typical catalysts. And by reducing the temperature, say from 800 to, to the level of 500 degrees Celsius, we can reduce the uh, energy intensity of this process significantly and make it much lower in terms of carbon footprint. In any case, any of these technologies which relate energy and mass materials, we always need to consider carbon dioxide and emissions. We're very excited at the University of Sydney to be launching very soon our net zero initiative, which brings together campus-wide multiple uh, schools and faculties and researchers in that space looking at addressing this emissions challenge. And of course, one always needs to think about what do we do with the CO2? How can we deal? Can we start looking at CO2 as a resource? That would be the challenge. I finish here just to sum up and I repeat my key message, my understanding of the circular economy, design, manufacturing, reuse, and uh, all of that is only achieved if there is partnerships and, and the call to action here is to develop and support those partnerships to fast track local innovation solutions. So with that, I'm looking forward to spending time with you and the panelists on Q&A, thanks. Thank you very much, Ali. Hugely insightful presentation. And I'm, I know there's so much more that you, you can share with us. Um, so great to, to get that um, mm. overview and again, some really uh, deep examples. I, I want to just, um, in, in sort of opening the panel up, I mean, there's a few questions that have come through this and, and it's a, a kind of common theme that's that's kind of been talked through. Is this the, this idea of up stream design, I guess, 
habits and how do we how do we accelerate the changes in upstream design, the taste and reducing body energy and, and all the kind of good things that we're talking about in our consumption patterns? Um, it, I mean, there was the suggestion, like uh, Ali's certification scheme, there's those talk about labeling. Um, what is the, you know, what's the role for government? What's the role for business in, you know, in leading that um, acceleration, I suppose, in, um, you know, driving that improvement in upstream design. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Kate, sorry. Yep. Not on um, just to kick off, uh, I guess, you know, we have a mixture of carrots and sticks. So um, in the in the plastic space, you know, the fact that we'll be banning some products obviously is a kind of stick that will stimulate um, producers to think about different Different kinds of design and initially just lightweight plastic bags and a few other things but that will be something we're keeping a watch on over time um, and we will have a big focus on product stewardship so we've said that product stewardship is increasingly important and Richard really referred to that as well that you know we should be thinking about the product through the whole life cycle um, and associated with that we'll have there are some of the funding that will be available to the circular materials fund which is to help producers in that for designing and trialing alternative materials so there's really quite a big role for government as well though I'd also echo what Monica made some really good points just about the education and the confusion and there were a couple of questions there you know it's a very challenging space if I could just add to that I think that I mean this it's really challenging to determine what do you mandate and what do you hope comes through through change. I had a fantastic presentation recently where I met with somebody, a, a company that produces a lot of plastic bottles for stuff. And what they showed it was just so fascinating just to spend time with their industrial engineers and uh, designers and see it, right? And what they showed me was a plastic bottle that's made 100% virgin, beautiful, clear, the pink you know, laundry liquid is gorgeous, it's pink, up on the shelf looks gorgeous. And then they showed me a bottle that was 10% recycled plastic, 20, 30, 40, 100%. By the time it got to 100%, I'm sure they'll work this out over time, it was grey. So no one was going to pick up the grey bottle because you couldn't see the beautiful pink laundry detergent off the shelf. Even if consumers say they want recycled, they're going to go to the bright pink virgin plastic bottle. If you mandate and everyone has to have 50%, everyone's got a grey bottle. Equal playing field, right? So there is a, like we just have to be bold you know if we don't want plastic in our oceans if we want to deal with it we have to help we all, we are also helping industry sometimes when we mandate because everyone's going to have the ugly plastic bottle i think i agree that um you know you've got to have a level playing field i think monica's point is is bang on you know you have to make this as a competitive environment for industry um and but, but not pick the solution for industry because, you know, regulators are not good. Um, and this is not a negative point to regulators, but they're not good at deciding on the technology and picking the actual solution. They know where they want to get to and they need to put the incentives in place. So, you know, I kind of think if you put the cost of whether something is recyclable or disposed with the manufacturer, they will optimize that. They will make it cheaper. They will go find the recyclable route that is lower cost because they have to pass those costs on, consu on to consumers. And ultimately we, we buy these things and the, the chain of custody passes to us when we choose, no one's forcing us to buy anything, when we choose to buy something. Um, so, you know, if we're given that choice, we can choose now to buy the more, ex you know, recyclable things today tend to be more expensive because, you know, we haven't got this circular economy going. So I think, you know, just switching the cost from local authorities having to pay for disposing and recycling to the manufacturer, it will pass to the consumer and industry is really good at optimizing its costs. And what you're really doing here is internalizing environmental cost. And that's been the success of all environmental movements around the world. You internalize that cost so business pays for it and then they reduce it. And by reducing it, they reduce the environmental impact. Look, I think there's also a piece here, Sam, about sandboxing and how we actually bring together solutions between researchers and industry because we still do have some failings here right we we also don't know where the waste streams are and we've got organizations we're working with that need massive amounts of PE and pp plastic where is it it's out there somewhere it's in a waste stream how do we make that matchmaking how do we catalyze the market in that way and then to ali's point and the great work that ali's been doing we need a space where researchers can focus um 
in a, in, a, in a way that the regulators approve of where we can start to trial new methodologies and new approaches um, that are just going to, you know, knock the socks off our problems but need that space to trial and fail and eventually get there. Maybe I could just add to that. I mean, Ali might, might comment, but that's also the for us the synergies between our waste strategy and the carbon strategies really come together with the kind of things that Lisa's just been saying. So, you know, the product stewardship will set that le level playing field, provide those incentives, and then we have other programs that are being considered initially from a net zero lens, but I think will be highly complementary where we're looking at how do we incentivize you know research, new initiatives, how do we co-locate industries so they can share infrastructure. Um, and there'll be a number of programs that we're looking at at that. So it all really comes together in the future of the clean economy. And, you know, I think that's, it's actually recognised in the New South Wales Economic Blueprint 2040 that, that waste and circular economy is one of the industries of the future. So. I just wanted to add uh, that data and digital, I think, back to Sam's question, will play a major factor, I think, in terms of how we accelerate to the, the circular economy. And uh, there, there are, I guess, lots of interesting local solutions on that and uh, the, how the how data and, uh, and, and modeling and, and uh, you know, a lot of work on digital twins and so on, all of that is going to feed into this circular economy and enable the circular economy. So it will be, who knows, in, you know, it's moving such, at such fast pace uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, very quick time that we see disruptions, if you like. I think there's, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify the problem because it's obviously not simple. But at one end, there's the, the continued work we must do about not creating the waste at all, right? We really have to do a lot of work there. And there's a lot more that can be done. And there's some lots of great examples in the chat, right? There's a lot of stuff. You know, there's a lot of packaging we don't need. There's a lot of products on those shelves that shouldn't be there. So that we have to deal with that. That's one end. But once then, and a number of speakers said this, but then there is waste. And it's a question of, of what you do with it. And I think Ali's presentation, what was so lovely about it was that, you know, that, that it looks at a whole of system kind of way of approaching the problem and says what's really important is that it's going to be horses for courses and it's going to be different for each place. I mean, the industry that you have in the place, the sort of people you have living in the place, all of those things um, can determine what that system might look like. What's really complicated about all of this is that what we're also trying to do is support the kind of facilities at the end, right? And, you know, the important work that's been done by the department and by the councils, because we've done, you know, exactly the same work around what are the current facility constraints and capacity is that we have to make we're very very soon we're going to have to make decisions about what that processing those processing plants are going to be because we're going to run out of capacity from the infrastructure that we've got so we've got there's a real urgency at trying to solve get rid of the waste we don't need deal with that understand what we've got really fast and what's possible before we invest or we let industry determine what the processing looks like complete outside of other con concerns. And we end up being forced to send our waste to certain types of processing, which is not necessarily the best one, right? So this is it's a really complex kind of dance of all these pieces at the moment that we're all trying to navigate, right? So I think that, that that's really is the, that's the place where we're at at the moment, which is why everyone's got to be on board now urgently trying to sort those pieces out. Monica, I just totally agree mm. with you. I, I think there's a piece here. Yes, we're recycling, reusing and reducing, but there's also a role for us to refuse. We need to be saying no to some waste streams and some products. And there are new fantastic options for us to share and reuse. We've seen it in fashion. It's coming. David Jones has got a quarter now you can go to and you can get fashion as a service. There's other options. We, we've seen at City Cities, Sydney's obviously seen shared mobility get incredibly um, successful and grow. And we're seeing that growing in lots of areas in a city, younger generation, also people that use, uh, can't afford a car, so forth. So I think there are some other options here um, that we need to start looking at. And I think adding the word refuse is really important to our three R's. 
I, I think it's always healthy to have a, you know, a level of debate in these kind of things. So I might just come out and say, I kind of think it's very difficult to ban things. I think it has a place, okay? And, you know, banning plastic forks and things maybe, but when it comes to the overall product range, different people have different, you know, needs and wants. And if you just internalize the cost, the environmental cost, then people have to pay for their choices. And then I think that's a fair, because otherwise who gets to choose? So an example would be, we're gonna ban plastic bags, okay? How is a balloon, a children's party balloon, different to a plastic bag? It's a thin piece of plastic. So we're banning balloons. I wouldn't be very popular. I'm not very popular at children's parties, as you can see, because I vote to ban the balloons and you vote to ban the plastic bags. And you do get perverse outcomes from bans. When plastic bags were banned in the UK, uh, the bags became 10 times thicker, so you could use the bags more often. So there was a reduction in the number of bags, but there was 10 times thicker, more plastic ended up being used. So, you know, I, I kind of think bands do have a place because they send a message, but in terms of deciding if someone can buy something or it's not allowed, I think you end up going down a road of who's going to decide what's not allowed. But, you know, the, the circular economy also, I, 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 you know, suggests that there, there needs to be a shift towards new circular business model. It's not always, it's not the technology that's going to solve the problem. And that's a lesson I've learned. And so circular business models also are important to address. And that, that means how do we design the circular business so it's, it's uh, feasible, it's financially feasible, it's, it survives, it makes its profits via leasing models, for example. And, and Lisa was talking about those ideas earlier uh, versus the buy-in models. You know, pushing products on the market, I think this is where this certification comes, you know, circular economy certification of products becomes important. It's kind of what you were saying earlier, Richard, about, I think you mentioned something, policy on import of materials. So having those types of uh, businesses and, and uh, uh, circular models around those businesses avoids those uh, materials entering the economy, but also it pushes the ownership of the product, and you mentioned that earlier, on the manufacturer. So solar panels, you know, you want to think about it. They've been pushed across the whole world. I'm not against solar panels at all. I, I all for renewable energy, of course. But how can we do that better? They're, they're a good product. They're being pushed on, but we need to think about their end of life as well. Who owns that end of life? That would be the question that one needs to address. I think Richard, is, oh sorry, it's, I mean, it was great that you threw that in because that really demonstrates the, the, the complexity of this argument. And also you made me think about, you know, the, the relationship of this sort of discussion with the community. And, and, and it's a really complex discussion, isn't it? Because on the one hand, people are really quite generally in this, this is one environmental space where people are quite motivated. They want to do the right thing, right? Not everyone, but generally, right? They sort of get it because they see the rubbish on the beach and they see, you know, they see it. So they want to do something about it. So they want to be involved. But sometimes actually, and I'm sort of going the other way here now, sometimes the solution actually isn't one. You know, sometimes it might just be simpler just to take all the garbage from the community, from the household in one bin and it gets sorted out by someone else. Because the idea of trying to train people to have five or six different bins and get it right, not contaminate. Do you know what I'm saying? Like some solutions might be simpler to, to, to manage that way um, in some places. So it's, it's a very, um, you know, we're all grappling with all of the components of this. And so I think that was a, such an important point that you made because on the one hand, people say, just don't allow it because that makes me feel better about it. But it yeah, doesn't necessarily fix it. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And it's a very emotive topic. And mm. some people feel, feel very strongly about it. And, but we've got to bring 90% of, of people along with us, right? So we're talking about a whole system that affects everybody. So you have to have a large amount of people. And I think you know, talking about banning things and stopping people consuming things and shutting down industries won't get the political support. So we have to plot a path which we can deliver. And, you know, as I said, I don't think anything's ruled out. We can have some bans and they give a strong signal and it makes sense. 
but it's not the overall solution. Otherwise, we'll be someone sitting in a chair saying, right, I'm going to allow chopsticks to be used, but I'm not going to allow socks to be sold with polyester content. And it's just not a viable proposition. It has to be a system in place which incentivizes manufacturers who will obviously pass all their extra cost onto consumers, right? So we've got to have a consumer in mind and the impacts on them. It's also a bit of a wild frontier, and we actually don't know what are in half these products, and that's what the researchers will tell us. Ali would be very familiar with this as well. And so we really need to understand what are the components that are going into products that are actually bad for us. It's a little bit like when we first started looking at calories and content in food. We really need to have way more information. So I think we're at the beginning of our journey in a lot of these products and components. You know, we, we've learned enough, you know, some I think of some waste um, manufacturing um, solutions that 14 years ago were world leading and now just, you know, they can't continue to produce the sort of um, solutions they're producing because of the stream, because of the waste stream and what's actually coming into the bin. And so there's a whole lot of stuff, PFAS and all this other stuff that we actually can't have in the economy anymore. We need to get rid of it. Doesn't mean we can't have our chopsticks. Doesn't mean we can't have our bottles or whatever we want. But the components going into making these things has to change. A, we need to know what's in it. And B, we do need to get some of it out. It can't stay in this, the, the economy. It's going to cause too much damage. Yeah. Just perhaps to talk about, pick up on Rich's point a bit more as well. I think your bans are definitely only part of the tool. And they do come where there is strong consumer sentiment. You know, we certainly had that banning the plastic bags. New South Wales was held up as a laggard for quite a long time until the Plastics Action Plan was released. So there's strong consumer sentiment. But we would only introduce bans where there is that support and we work, you know, we're currently working very carefully with a reference group and, you know, there will be some products that we can't, we don't want to ban entirely because there are sectors of the community, for instance, disabled community, you know, who require some of those products for their day-to-day -day life. So we're certainly, it, you know, it is a complex thing. You're right about that. Um, and I guess I'd say secondly, the, you know, the strong preference of government is to have incentives that are going to create jobs and growth, the old mantra, but you know, that are going to be good for the economy and actually stimulate new businesses. We're all about moving to a new business model, not, not shutting things down through, um, you know, through bans. So I think your comments are spot on, Richard. Yeah, and, and I think the policy that, that New South Wales has set out does tick all those boxes. And now you're moving to the, to the intricacies of how do we deliver yeah. that policy, yeah. which is, you know, it's a very, very challenging area because we're not talking about just one sector that can jump in and invest in a facility that solves it. We're talking about the way we live entire lives and everything we buy. Yeah. So yeah. it's pretty complicated and you've got to get everyone on board. As I'm, it's been the easiest um, moderation uh, of my career, just <laughs> setting you guys up and letting you bounce off each other. It's been awesome. And, and I think you've, you've also done a great job of covering, I'm not going to say all of the questions that have been popping up, but certainly touching um, a lot of the issues that have been popping up in the, in the Q&A. Um, we knew we were going to run out of time when we tried to, you know, take take these really complex issues and, and cover them in an hour and a half. But unfortunately, we've come to that that moment. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for your time, for your reflections, uh, for your efforts to answer the, the questions that have been coming up in the chat. And, and to be clear that this is, you know, this is only the first um, you know, the first conversation, I suppose, in, in what we're trying to do with the committee in bringing these issues um, to bear, but also, obviously, there's a lot of work to do. Um, so if there's any, you know, if there's any closing statement you'd like to make, then, then please do, recognising that we are, we are um, very quickly running out of time. So it's a really important issue and, um, you know, I think if we thought it touches everyone's lives, it makes it so complex and so interesting to everybody. Local solutions. Mm -hmm. And um, and thank you, Kate and the team for uh, you know a fantastic strategy. I mean, it's it means now we all have a roadmap that we can work we can work on together. So it's brilliant. Thank you. And I think we've all got a role to play in it. So the more we can inform ourselves, the more we can understand and look at our own supply chains and our own purchasing power, the better. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great afternoon and weekend, and I look forward to the next uh, Community for Sydney event. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sam.